This morning's service is going to be a little bit different because the first couple of thirds of our time together is going to be in this room, and then the, set, the last third of our worship time is going to be among the community praying. So this morning is going to be a little bit different, but I do need to warn you, if you cannot live without more caffeine, we're not doing a meet and greet. So you're not going to be able to get coffee because we're going to try and save some time. So if you need caffeine, go now. Otherwise, I'm not responsible. Let's worship the Lord. You're so good, Lord. your greatness and we thank you Lord Jesus that in this day where we remember the sacrifices that have been made we do not want to forget the sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us we praise you we exalt your name it's in Jesus name we pray amen Desperation, 
this 
you showed on the cross to make a way for us to spend eternity with you. God, we are just humbled in your presence today. Lord, as we think about um, just Memorial Day weekend, we think about those brave men and women who gave their lives in service for our country. We honor them. We thank them uh, for their service, and we think about them today. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for, for those brave people. And Lord, may we just honor and glorify you today and every day as we leave here from this service, God. Speak to us within our hearts and our minds what Pastor Gary is going to say. And Lord, give us courage and boldness as we go forth in our community. God, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so hopefully, first of all, good morning. Hopefully you got your coffee. And uh, so as you sit down, we would like you to do kind of a meet and greet right here at your seats. Turn, wave to someone you know, say good morning, hello, and uh, go ahead and do that as you sit down. The monitor is supposed to be coming up. The mom, yeah, everything. All righty. Well, good morning. We're just going to be, um, we'll continue on. All right, very good. I got to go ahead. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hopewell Church. If you're here in our, thank you. Props. That's good. There you go. Okay, very good. Thank you. If you're here in the service, we want to say thank you for coming out. If you are visiting us, uh, with us online and watching online, we want to say good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot of things um, to, to go through this morning. First of all, if you are new with us, today. Thank you so much for making this part of your Sunday morning. We have a bulletin, and at the bottom of the bulletin, there's a place for you to give some information about yourself so that we can get to know you better. You can drop that off at the Welcome Center and receive a gift on the way out. If you have any prayer requests, there's also a place uh, at the back of the bulletin for you to drop off uh, either at the Welcome Center or in the boxes in the back. Uh, we welcome you to do that. Um, if you are prepared to give today, we of course say thank you so much. We are so grateful for both the gift and you, the giver. There are a couple ways to do it. You can do it through our app on our website. There's boxes in the back for you to drop it off on your way as you exit as well. And we say thank you. Thank you so much for that as well. Um, it is that time. If you are in fifth or sixth grade, there are teachers who have prepared a wonderful lesson, and they are eager to bless you this morning. So they are going to be exiting. Thank you so much 
fifth and sixth graders for coming, bringing your parents today. That's awesome. We will see you later. <laughs> All righty. Uh, wonderful announcement. Our church body is growing. Mike and Amanda Schaefer have their baby girl this week. She is the sixth of their little ones. Her name is Lillian Margaret. And uh, we just want to uh, keep them in our prayers, blessings over the life of this dear little girl. Um, also, First Friday is coming up, um, obviously, next Friday, which is the first Friday of June. A wonderful worship service is being prepared for all of you. We hope you come and join us. There's going to be a pretzel bar, so we're always about food here, so that's, that's awesome. But come on out and join us for that worship service. Uh, Today, our service, as Pastor Rick had alluded to, our, our service today is just a bit different. Part of it is going to be here, but it's going to be extending throughout the walls here of Hopewell. Uh, hopefully, you know, by now we're doing a prayer walk after the service. If you have not signed up yet, there are sign-up sheets out there in the lobby so that uh, you know, people will know to expect you at some of the locations. We have a couple of options for you. Um, some of the walks are going to be a bit more guided, where we have a leader um, assigned to, to be there to kind of guide you. Here are the guided prayer walk. We just, again, we just gave some suggestions. Here are some places that perhaps you would consider going. We have Anchored Ministries. Erica Kantner, I believe, is here. And uh, if not, oh, there she is. Oh, oh, if you want to stand up, give a wave. That's awesome. There's Erica. Conestoga Christian School. Derek Ryder and his family. There he is. Hey, Derek. Uh, they're going to be your leaders there. Daniel Boone Intermediate School. Beth Haynes is going to be. There she is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We are about food, not below bribery. All right, that's good. Uh, okay, we also have free, uh, freedom and restoration for everyone enslaved. Becky Jones is going and also, um, and Andrea McHenry and her husband Clark are going to be uh, leading that. Uh, we would love to see more people signed up and going into the city. High Point Academy, Eileen McGuire is going to be our leader there. And Hope Rescue Mission, Ed Haynes, who does not have cookies, but uh, nonetheless, uh, he's going to be going. Um, so, yes, we'd love to see more people head into Hope Rescue with Ed as well. Uh, Tell High Camp, we have Jonathan Fabian. He's going to be leading there. There he is. And also Twin Valley High School, Nick and Melissa Kohler. Melissa is one of our teachers there at Twin Valley, and they're going to be leading um, the, the prayer guide there, the prayer walk there. Um, if you would prefer an unguided prayer walk, we have some suggestions. Uh, Birdsboro, East Earl, Elverson, Geigertown, Honeybrook, Morgantown. Um, perhaps you just want to go and uh, just walk, pray. Uh, maybe you just want to pull up to a park. Uh, maybe you want to walk down the street. Uh, we have prayer guides, again, out in the lobby at the sign-up table. They're in blue, so you can't miss them. It's just some suggested ideas. If you're just um, wondering um, some, some specific ways to pray, just a helpful prayer guide as you go out and walk. And we also encourage you, have your ears and eyes open. You may be interacting with people um, who may see you praying, who uh, you may just feel like the Holy Spirit is just giving you a nudge to speak to them. Please be courageous and bold and, and, uh, and say hello and, and perhaps um, look for opportunities to encourage, embrace um, people today. Maybe you want to grab one of these little cards at the Welcome Center as well um, and hand, uh, hand that out as well. When the service is over today, um, as we know, children are a blessing from the Lord. So we are going to encourage you to pick up your blessings immediately <laughs> so that we can lock the doors and that we can give the teachers an opportunity to go out on the prayer walk. So uh, again, we thank you for doing that. And um, speaking of blessing and food, we want to bless everyone here with lunch. Whether or not you are going out to the prayer walk right away, we encourage you all to do so. Um, some people said, you know, I, I, I'm going to be going tomorrow. That's fine. Um, some people are going to be getting in their cars and just driving and praying. Nonetheless, we have lunch for everyone. And if you're joining us online, um, we encourage you to join us in the prayer walk as well in your own way, whatever you feel called 
uh, to do. So again, lunch. Uh, we have uh, three sandwiches, three different types. We have roast beef, we have ham, we have turkey, we also have gluten-free options. Uh, there are going to be bags in the lobby. Please grab a bag and uh, enjoy the blessing of lunch before you head off and do your prayer walk. I think that covers all of the prayer walk announcements and uh, all the announcements for myself. I'm going to be welcoming Pastor Gary, who is finishing up the sermon series on Acts, The Church Advances. So I'll turn it over to Pastor Gary. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Marion. You're welcome. All right. Well, um, let me ask you all a question before I jump into the message. If um, I, I know we all like money, right? Some of us more than others. So uh, if I was to say to somebody... Um, you know, like Jeff. Uh, Jeff, uh, I have two options for you. I can, uh, how much money, first of all, would make you happy? <laughs> Just dream, dream big, dream big. How much money would make you happy? Just pick a number. $10,000. Okay. All right. That's as big, all right. So I'm going to write, I have a check here, right? So I'm going to write a check to Jeff for $10,000, and it's totally good. If you cash it, it's totally good. And I'm going to sign it. Okay, so now you have a choice. You can either take this check for $10,000 or you can take this, this coin. <laughs> now, I don't know if you can tell from there what kind of coin this is, but you get one or the other. Which one are you taking? Okay, he's taking the check. A wise man, right? Now, but what if I told you that I'm going to take these two items, these two things that are worth money, and I am going to burn them? Okay. <laughs> Now, which one would you rather have? <laughs> which, which one would you rather have? Hope the fire alarm doesn't go off. But I think you see the point of what I'm trying to say here is that it's very easy to look at these. This is going to smolder for a while. That we can look at these things, and it reminds us of First Peter 1, 6 to 7, which says, You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as we see in our, in our sermon series we're wrapping up today, uh, and I titled this, the title of this sermon, Acts 29, um, as we're wrapping up the series, we know that the Apostle Paul, uh, he was refined by fire. He went through a lot. And there were a lot of difficult things that he went through. And as you see right here, the, the, of course, this represents, you know, the check is kind of like the things that the world has to offer us. It writes big numbers. And it, and it kind of says, hey, look at all these things that you can have. It makes a lot of promises, a lot of empty promises. Or you can have the thing that's going to last, even if it's refined through fire. And this, you know, this, this isn't actually gold, but, it, but Jesus Christ is precious, precious gold. And no matter how much fire you put them through, the gold will still be gold. And so this is my hope and desire for all of us is that through this is that we will each of us be refined by the fire of God. Now, Paul has been refined. He's been whipped. He's been stoned. He's been run out of town. He's been uh, smeared. He's been slandered. I mean, every, almost every persecution or type of persecution you can imagine, Paul has been through it. But he keeps on going. So what helps us as followers of Christ today, be Christians who keep pressing on and pushing through the fire because how many of you know that to be a Christian, if we're really following Jesus, there should be resistance. There should be moments of fire that we walk through. But what holds us back from being courageous? Because I can tell you, I, I'm not always courageous. Can I admit that to you all? I'm not always courageous. I don't want you thinking like, oh, Gary, you're a pastor. You can always be courageous. No, I am a human being who is a pastor also. But there are moments where I'm like, oh, I don't know. Or I get a little bit scared. But what holds us being courageous like Paul and just going anywhere with the gospel, doing anything for the gospel, what holds us back? One thing that's really important is that we need each other. And we see this throughout the book of Acts. The church needs the church. This is how God designed it. Billy Graham said this, Courage is contagious. When a brave man takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened. And it's really true, isn't it? It's like you try to be courageous for Jesus by yourself, good luck. It's really, really hard. But when we are courageous together, there is something in us that rises up. Like, yes, we can do this. 
So my hope today is that Paul's courage will rub off on all of us and that, we'll, that he will be contagious to us, even though he lived 2,000 years ago, that we would take the hope of Jesus wherever God would send us, wherever God, however God would have us do it. So now Paul, as we're wrapping up this, this series, Paul has now finished his third missionary journey, and he's returned to Jerusalem. So we're going to pick this up in Acts 21, verse 17. When we, so Luke, the author, is with him now at this point, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard this, they praised God. There wasn't any jealousy involved. They're like, like oh, man, God, why would you use Paul and not me? You know, why would you use him in this amazing way but not me? And there is just no room for jealousy like that in the church, is there? There just can't be. You know, last week as, as uh, Tyler was teaching, if you were here, I thought, Tyler, you did a fantastic job. And you're, you're just preaching your guts out. And so thank you for doing that. Yeah. And, and to be honest, like, like I, I, I promise you, I was not sitting there like, oh, man, his, he's got a better voice than me. His, he's stronger than me. I wasn't like seething down there like this. I'm, I'm being all honest with you. I was like, yes. Like I was rooting for him. And I was actually like worshiping and saying, God, look at what you've done in his life. And now you're using him to bless others. And I was, I was rooting for him. And there can't be room for jealousy in the church. This reminds me of a scene from uh, a popular TV show I saw. And, um, and this is not a full endorsement of this TV show, to be clear. But it's uh, the show The Office. And uh, I want to show you a quick little clip of a scene where some of the employees of this, in case you've never seen it, it's a paper supply office company. They decide to have a friendly game of basketball. And uh, the boss, Michael Scott, is off his game. So let's just play the video clip there. That's me some Sundays. Dwight, I was open. <laughs> I, oh, that always stuck with me. He hits his three-pointer. He's like, I was open. You know, and I think sometimes it's like we can do that in the church, can't we? Where it's like, and, we, and I've seen it happen many times where it's like somebody else is doing something that you wish you could do in the church. Uh, and it could be anything. Sometimes, sometimes you, I've heard people say, oh, man, I wish I could, I had a servant's heart like so-and-so in the way that they do this or the way they distribute sandwiches. And I'm like, you can do that. But, like, you know, we, we don't want to have jealousy hold us back. And there was no jealousy like that in the early church, at least not that we see in the scriptures. It was all about giving Jesus glory. That's all they cared about. It's like, I don't care who's doing what. As long as we are all giving Jesus glory and honor, that is what is the most important thing. But then the church leaders warn Paul of something, and they tell him that there's a rumor going around, Paul, that you're going around telling that the Jewish people who have become Christians, that they need to abandon all their Jewish ways, that all the things that they've been doing, that, and, and that, now is that true? It's absolutely not true. We remember Paul actually had Timothy circumcised just to help him connect to the Jews and that there wouldn't be a barrier between them. So Paul wasn't saying that to become a, a Christian means you abandon all of the, what it means to be a Jew as well. And so they encouraged Paul to go to the temple. They said, go to the temple and make a sacrifice there and do some stuff there so that they, the other Jews can see that you're still a, a good Jewish man. <laughs> and so now here's the thing. Paul, Paul did this, but did he have to? No, he didn't have to do this. But Paul's like, you know what? I'm going to do this, even though none of these accusations were true. Now here's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9. He said this. Although I am free from all men, from, sorry, I'm, I'm free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. Just stop there for a second. Think about this. This is hard for us sometimes because as Americans, we love our rights, right? And, and our, our rights as Americans are good. I want to be clear about that. But our rights as Americans are not as important as us doing whatever it takes to reach people with the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's so important to remember that, that that Paul's basically saying, I'll be a slave to anyone. I'll lay down my rights if it means winning them to Christ. And then verse 20. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. So my point number one for following along is this. Is that courageous Christians lay down their rights for the sake of the gospel. And Paul is just an imitator of who? Jesus. Did he lay down his rights? Absolutely. He laid down his rights profoundly for us. 
you know, even in the end, I think about it, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, and people are mocking at him, and they're, they're, whole, they're, they're putting through pain, and they're just ridiculing him, they're spitting in him, his face, and he's there, and they, was it his right, if he wanted to, to speak a few words, and like a billion angels would come down, just decimate and blow up everyone who's mocking him, is that his right? Yeah, he absolutely could have done that. That was his right. But he stayed true to who he was in his mission and said, I'm laying down my rights as I sacrifice for every human. And Paul was laying down his rights. And so the, the, the challenge for all of us, and myself included here, is that will I lay down my rights? And, and uh, we're not saying this in an American sense. I'm saying this just like, you know, what I, who I, my preferences, the things that I want to have, the way that I want church to be, all those kind of things. Um, Will we lay down our rights so that people can meet Jesus? It's your right to go where you want to go and to work where you want to work. Talk to who you want to talk to. Those are your rights. But think of it this way. You can't carry your cross at the same time you were holding on to your rights. It takes two hands. I mean, a cross is heavy. And if we're like, I got my cross, but I also got my rights, it's like, that doesn't make any sense, does it? You, you know, you can't. It's one or the other. Either you hold on to your rights or you hold on to your cross. You, if you're carrying on to your rights, you're not really dying to yourself. And that's a challenge. I mean, that, to me, that is one of those deep, deep challenges that I struggle with. Well, then the next day, Paul goes to the temple, but the Jews drag him to the temple, and they begin to beat him. So, welcome home, Paul. Welcome home to Jerusalem. The Roman soldiers saw what was happening. They, they took Paul away, kind of for his own safety, but they wanted to figure out what's really going on here. So my point number two is this, that courageous Christians can endure persecution because, of the, suffer, because the suffering servant is with them. We will be called names. We will be persecuted. We'll be shot down. We'll be slandered. We will be called the immoral ones. But we must stand strong in the truth. It's only going to get harder to be a Christian in our nation. Now, speaking about the divide in our country, um, a political leader said this. He said, we have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity, which we've had for a long time. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. Think about that. We have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. Sounds like us, doesn't it? And that was an actual quote from Abraham Lincoln in 1863 when he enacted a national day of prayer and fasting. We have forgotten God. You know, we had this idea that, like, oh, you know, we've always been a Christian nation. We have, there's been a Christian influence in our nation. But even back then, when the nation was divided, like Abraham Lincoln's main focus was we have forgotten God. And when we forget God, that's when everything else falls apart. It will take great courage for us to stay the course. This is why meeting together in church is so important as much as possible. As much as possible, you're able to meet together with the church in person. It's so important. Why? Hebrews 10.25 says, We should not be neglecting to gather together as some are in their habit of doing, but encouraging each other all, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I, I spoke to someone recently who, said, who hadn't been in, in, in a, at a church service in person for three years. And they said, yeah, you know what? I'm actually really good. I'm good. I don't, I don't need it. And I said, well, that's great for you. But here's the problem is that according to Hebrews 10, the main reason that we come together is not just about you, is it? It's about you encouraging someone else. And so this is why it's so important that we not neglect meeting together in person as much as possible. Because we need each other. Someone may need you. Even if you feel like you're good, someone needs you. This is the point of the church. As Paul was being taken away then, Paul was asked to speak to the crowds, and he courageously shares his testimony with everyone. And then Paul's brought before the Sanhedrin, which is basically like the supreme court um, of the Jewish nation. In Acts 23, verse 10, it says, When the dispute became violent, the commander feared that Paul might be torn apart by them and ordered the troops to go down, take him away from them, and bring him into the barracks. 
The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, have courage. For as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so it is necessary for you to testify in Rome. I love that picture, isn't it? God stood by him and he said, have courage. I encourage you guys is that wherever you are, whatever you're going through right now, like God is standing by you and he's saying, have courage. That's the same message to all of us. And just like with Paul, I believe that God has a specific plan for all of us. But it's interesting, Paul's specific plan, I would have loved this. How, do, how many of you like this kind of clarity where God's saying, you got to be in Rome. Like how, how many of you would love it if God told you and said, you, you have a destiny in this place, in this time, in this date. Because what Paul's like, oh, you, you're going to make sure I'm in Rome? That means he knows he's not going to die until he gets to Rome. How many of you like that kind of insurance? Like, what would you do with your life if you knew that, oh, I'm at least going to live until 2065? Like, you know, I'd be like, all right, so I'm flying to North Korea. I'm going to be, you know, witnessing and handing out Bibles in North Korea. I'm going to eat at McDonald's every day. You know, it's like, whatever, it doesn't matter what you do. Like, it, it, but imagine having that kind of assurance. But at the same time, I'm, all, I'm convicted and thinking, like, well, what's the difference? You know, like, what's the difference? Whether I, whether I know I'm going to live until 2065 or if I know that, or it could be tomorrow, is that I should still live with that kind of abandon, or it's just like, you know what, I'm in your hands, God. You know how many days I got. And that's how we can be courageous. Paul's trial continues, and then he's brought before this a Roman official named Festus. And then the Jews who went to send, him, send Paul to Jerusalem uh, were planning to ambush Paul and attack him along the way. But in Acts 25, 11, it says this, Paul said, if then I did anything wrong and I am deserving of death, I am not trying to escape death. But if there is nothing to what these men accuse me of, no one can give me up to them, and I appeal to Caesar. They keep trying him and trying him, but no one can really figure out anything specifically wrong that he did. So he's like, I appeal to Caesar, the ruler of Rome. Festus then says, fine, to Caesar you'll go. So my point number three is this. Courageous Christians focus on spreading life, not escaping death. We put a lot of priority, don't we, on trying to not die in our, in our world? But not dying should not be our primary focus. I'm not saying that you should be running to die, but it shouldn't be our main focus. The, uh, the, the film quote about William Wallace is that uh, every man dies, not every man really lives. And that is such a true resonating quote. I remember as a kid, um, I played a lot of sports, but one of the sports I played a lot as a kid was baseball. And I remember I was, up to, I was in the batter's box, you know, ready to go up to the plate to, to bat. And the kid in front of me is up there. And, and the, the kid who was pitching on the other team was just hurling those balls in there. Just, it looked like 98 miles an hour to my, like, you know, 10-year-old eyes. And uh, he's throwing them in there. And sure enough, he hits the kid in front of me in the face. And there's blood pouring out, you know, and I'm like, and he's like, oh, mom, you know, running to his mom. And I got my bat, and I'm like, oh, I'm next. And I, and I go up, and I, I remember standing in the plate, and I mean, I, so if this is the batter's box right here, you know, like this, like this is the home plate, and this is the edge of the batter's box, my to, I'm like out like this, you know, and I'm, I'm barely, my bat is the only thing in the batter's box. And my coach is like, Gary, get in the box. I'm like, and I like put like two toes in, you know, and, and I, I was so hesitant to do it. And, you know, the first, you know, the first pitch, and I kind of like swung like this, you know, just not even trying. And uh, I was just, I had, I had no interest in, in, in a, that at bat. And, but I remember my, my coach just yelling, Gary, stay in the box, stay in the box. And I feel like that's what God's saying to all of us. It's that we're all to stay in the box. Yes, there will be times where it gets a little bloody or times where it gets a little messy or we'll take insults. We will be persecuted. We should expect it. But we need to have that courage to stay in the box. And God is just yelling to us, like, stay in the box because your reward is great. We, we may not always feel like we hit a home run every time, but I promise you that if you stay true to Jesus, your last at bat will be a grand slam. It has to be. Because we know we win. We don't have to worry about it. You could strike out in the first inning. <laughs> but you will hit a grand slam on the final at bat. It's a walk-off run. It's a walk-off win. This is what God is saying to us. Stay in the box. Run the race. God and may God make us courageous, whether it's to go overseas or to walk over the street to our neighbor's house. Because sometimes going over to our neighbor's house takes more courage than going overseas, we're being honest. A few days later then, in this story, King Agrippa arrives, and Paul's brought before him. 
Uh, Agrippa was considered a Jewish expert. Now, who is this King Agrippa? So King Agrippa is really interesting. The text doesn't tell us, but history does. His great-grandfather was Herod, who tried to kill Jesus. His grandfather was the one who beheaded John the Baptist. And now here's Paul standing before this person in this line of royalty. Uh, and, and he's going to be thinking, like, am I next? This is, this is King Agrippa, but he's an expert on Jewish culture and Jewish affairs. Now, what Paul does is then he starts telling Agrippa his story of his conversion on the road to Damascus. But he, uh, there was something that was left out earlier in the book of Acts that now he adds, something that Jesus said. In Acts 26, 14, Jesus said this. He's recalling it. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads were like a, a sharp stick or something that, that people would use, and they would poke and prod the animals to keep them moving and to keep going along their way. And so what's interesting is that Paul, therefore, must have been, before he was converted on the road to Damascus, he must have been feeling some kind of a prodding or a conviction of the Holy Spirit to, to recognize that maybe what, who Jesus was was real. And so he was responding to that. So, and maybe that's you today. Maybe you feel like the Holy Spirit has been kind of prodding you or poking you in a certain direction. And maybe it's a ministry direction or something you need to do in your community or, or your job or something where you feel like God's prodding you, but you're like, I don't know, and you're resisting it. Maybe you've never given your faith to Jesus. And you've been, you've been feeling those prods and those pokes, but you're like, ah, I don't know if this is the right timing. But v- point number four is this. Courageous Christians surrender to the leading of God's Spirit. There's nothing courageous about resisting God. I think of it like this. It's like jumping out of an airplane and refusing to pull the parachute cord. That's, to me, a lot of times what it's like to resist God's prodding. But if you follow the Holy Spirit to whatever end, that's, that's, that's courage. Paul goes on to tell Agrippa all about Jesus being the Messiah. And it's interesting, in Acts 26, 28, It says, Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. This is where you can really hear Paul's heart. And this is my heart for for us today as we go out into our communities and and as as we pray for our communities. This wish isn't like a genie in the bottle wish. What, that Paul is saying, like, I wish, where he says, I wish before God. This is making our desire to see our communities be radically transformed, that they be radically transformed out of the chains of depression and anxiety and fear and all the things that are pushing our, our world and our communities down. When we're going into our communities, we're praying that God and his light would just bring deliverance and truth and restoration uh, and hope and light into our world and our communities in these ministries. And it's, it's not some, some genie in the bottle wish. It's like we wish before God, that God, we're making this desire known to you, that this is what we're asking for. Nothing, um, nothing will change our communities and bring revival to our communities like Jesus. Nothing will change hearts and minds like Jesus will. Everything else the world has to offer is temporary. It's all a temporary change or a little tweak. Only Jesus makes makes something that was old, something completely new. And only Jesus will take what was dead and make it alive. That's only Jesus can do that. And so what we're bringing to our world is the truth and light of Jesus Christ. It is that hope that nothing else can replicate. Since Paul then demanded that he see Caesar, Augustus and Festus are like, all right, fine. There's nothing we can figure out here. You want to go to Caesar? We would have just let you go. But since you asked to see Caesar, we have to send you to Caesar. So they, uh, they, they send Paul onto a boat with a bunch of other prisoners, and off they go. But sometime into their journey, a huge storm hit, and it lasted for days. And so the people in the storm and all the prisoners, and everyone, they're just dumping cargo over the side of the ship because the storm is about to take down their ship. Does this sound familiar to another biblical story? Maybe Jonah? Only the circumstances here are a little different. So Paul says to them, and think about it, he's saying this to to criminals and Roman guards. He says this, Now I urge you to take courage, because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. How does Paul know that he's not going to die in the ship, and they're not going to die? Because you've got to get to Rome. For last night an angel of God I belonged to and served stood, stood by me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. It's necessary for you to appear before Caesar. 
And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take courage, men, because I believe God, uh, because I believe God that it will be just the way it was told to me. This reminds me, of course, when Jesus was walking on water, wasn't it? As he was walking out to the disciples on the lake in Mark 6, when, during, when they had a storm. And Jesus said this. He said, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And then he got into the boat with them, and the wind, wind ceased. If we go back to the story of Paul, what's happening in here is that why were those people safe? It's because Paul was with them. Now, did Paul bring Jesus onto the boat with him? Yes. <laughs> Jesus actually got into that boat with them in the book of Acts because Paul was with them. So point number five is this. Courageous Christians run into other people's storms because Jesus is with them. Isaiah 43, 1 to 2, God said this. He said, I will be with you when you pass through the waters and the rivers will not overwhelm you. It's an amazing thing when you think about it. When you go into other people's storms, you're taking Jesus into those storms. The ship eventually hit a sandbar, and it starts to fall apart, though. So things aren't looking good, but miraculously, they all reach an island called Malta. This is actually a picture of where we believe, uh, Malta was back then. Now, while on the island, they encounter some locals, and while they're there, uh, Paul's there, he's gathering sticks for fire, and a, and a venomous snake bites him. And uh, the locals are like, well, you're dead. And Paul's like, nope. And uh, he doesn't die. And so they're like, this is a miracle. And then while they're there, it's also amazing is that Paul finds out that there is a, a person who's sick, like really sick. And Paul goes and lays his hands on him and heals him and prays for him. He's healed. And then like everyone's coming out and asking to be healed. And it's like this major revival happening on this island of Malta. Um, and so my point number six is this. Courageous Christians see every hindrance as an opportunity for deliverance. I confess, this is not an area in which I thrive very well. When I'm inconvenienced, I can get pretty grumpy. Uh, a number of years ago, I was, on a, I was waiting for a flight to go uh, to Colorado, and, and, uh, and the flight got delayed, the flight got delayed, and then the flight got canceled eventually. And we, probably many of you have been in situations like that, something like that. I, I promise you, I, in that airport, I was not thinking like, while I'm here, who can I pray for? You know, I just didn't think that. Paul has, is on a ship with prisoners. He's shipwrecked. Snakes are biting him. And he's like, who can I bless? And I'm thinking, like, why am I not thinking like that? And so Paul's got this mindset of, like, I'm, I'm and the text tells us he was there for three months. And Paul's there, I'm going to take advantage of this inconvenience, and I'm going to bless the world. And that's what happened. Eventually, another boat arrives. And they finally set off, and they arrive at Rome. Now, Paul wrote his letter to the Romans three years before he ever got to Rome. That's important to remember. So when he arrives there, there's already Christians there from Pentecost, but they, 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 they know who Paul is because he wrote them this letter. And so they're there, and they greet him, and he's encouraged by them. But when Paul gets there, he's kept under house arrest with one guard. And this one guard kind of changes back and forth. But people would come to his, his home that he was staying at to hear his message about Jesus. Can you imagine that? They're, they're like people were going to the prison, basically, to hear about Jesus. Then Acts 28, 30, it says this. Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And that is where the book of Acts ends. It's almost like we should be expecting, like, to be continued, Right? We're not, Luke doesn't tell us if Paul ever got to stand before Caesar. Luke doesn't tell us a lot of things about what happened at the end of this. We don't know, actually, technically what happened to Paul. The early church tradition that was told down through the years says that at one point he was uh, beheaded by Caesar Nero in a Roman prison. We don't know if it's 100% true, but it's pretty sure. But we don't know. We, think he actually, we do think that he eventually got out of this prison and then traveled later on. But while he was in that prison, he wrote uh, four books, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Did Paul take advantage of rough times? Yeah. He wrote letters that helped transform our lives. You, right now, today, have been impacted and changed because of Paul's time in his house prison in Rome. And the world has been changed. Governments, laws were affected by the things that he wrote in those letters and all of his letters. 
So why aren't we told what happened to Paul? Well, this book isn't about Paul. This book actually isn't even about the apostles. It's not so, even so much about the church. The main character, the main person in this story is Jesus. Acts 29 was never written. Or was it? Many of you may have heard this before, but we are living in an Acts 29 world. This that we're living in right now is the, the to be continued. We have now entered the story of Acts. And what God is doing through you, through his Holy Spirit, he's writing all new stories. I know so many of you have so many awesome stories about how God met you and also how God has used you to reach out and bless the lives of others. Jesus is still moving in this world through us. So if you're going through a fire, I encourage you to keep your eyes open. Philippians, this is, I'm going to read from Philippians 1, verse 12. And again, Paul wrote this in this prison. He said, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. He's like, because I'm in prison, it's actually advanced the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence or courage in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death, because for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's it. That is Paul's heart and desire for all of us. So today, my hope and desire for our church is not just today, but from now forward is that we are people who are willing to lay down our rights for others. We're, we're going to go out into our communities and we're going to pray because we care about, more about them than we care about our own rights or our own convenience. We are living out Acts 29. And so if we could, let's stand together. We're going to sing a psalm before we go. Christian courage is not something that we drum up inside of ourselves. It's not like we go and we're like, all right, all right, Gary, let's, let's be more courageous today. That's not how that works. The reason why we can be courageous is because our faith is in Christ and that Christ is with us and that Christ lives inside of us and that he goes with us wherever we go. He's in the fire with us. And that's my encouragement to you all. You never go alone. There have been so many times where I felt like God was prompting me to pray for somebody or to talk to somebody. I didn't want to. But, but God reminded me, he's like, I'm with you. In the book of Acts, it says that he will, and Jesus says, you know, I, I will tell you what to say. And the Holy Spirit will lead us what to say. He will fill us and empower us in those very moments. So let's sing this song with that conviction. Let's sing. sing with me. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Sing it out. Standing next to me. Can you see him? There was another in the waters, holding back the sea. Should I ever be reminded of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me. There is another in the fire. On my deck, on my deck, left the dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. 
Father, I pray that as we go now, Lord, that you would give us that boldness, that courage to go, to pray, just simply to walk through the streets or to pray over these ministries, Lord, that you have put in our hearts. We thank you for the privilege and honor of doing this, Lord. We thank you for the food that we're about to eat and just pray that you would bless that time together, bless the, any fellowship that happens. You lead and guide us by your Holy Spirit through all of this, Jesus. You are with us. Thank you, Lord. Be a light in this world. May we take your light with us. May people see Jesus through us, Lord. In your name, amen.